Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Production value just abounds because uh, I hit the wrong button, so you saw my face there for the intro. But everyone, it's perfectly okay. Welcome into the Computer America Show. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us today on the program. We have the one, the only, Mr. Ralph Bond. And of course, we're going to have a lot of different stories, uh, some more space-focused, but hey, we have some stuff here down down to earth as well. And ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be a fun segment. I always love doing these on a Friday because I can't think of a better way to head out into the weekend than with a bit of Ralph Bond. But before we get to that, ComputerAmerica.com, that's where you'll find everything, past shows, future shows, show notes, articles, reviews, um, social media links, contests, giveaways, everyone, and of course, lots of Ralph Bond. You can find more of his segments there at our website, at his website, which we have a link in the show notes, and of course, you can find the show notes. I should probably make a special point of that because Ralph does a great job compiling the show notes, and if you want to Double check us, fact check us, say, no way can we actually, can we actually have a hope for the future. That's not possible. Show me the article. Uh, we can do that for you. It's right there in the show notes. So with that being said, ComputerAmerica.com, let's go ahead and bring Ralph on. And as always, Ralph is our science and technology trends correspondent here for Computer America. And of course, also the tech insider for the Mark Mason Show over at KEX Portland, Oregon. Ralph, welcome back on to Computer America. How you doing? I'm doing great. And like we were saying before we went on air here, what a week for science with the release of the James Webb telescope images and data. I mean, it's just jaw dropping, needless to say. <laughs> No kidding, no kidding. Yeah, and uh, you know the James Webb Telescope. Uh, I, I think by this point you have to be living under one of the most massive rocks if you don't know about it. But for those who are somehow finding themselves under that massive rock, this is a uh, a program or uh, I should say a mission that's been uh, kind of going since I think like the mid '90s or the early 2000s, Ralph. And uh, with that being said, it's. Uh, you know, it all came to fruition. We saw alignment pictures and they were setting it up here early yeah. in the year. You know, I think that's when a lot of people right. really started to tune in. But just this week, we had the president of the United States kind of show off the uh, the images. And then, of course, you have, uh, you know, the actual images over, I believe it's like nasa.gov forward slash webs first images or something like that. Yeah, um, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Ralph, they're... Uh, I think the thing that's you know stuck out to me, uh, as as I'm sure it did with you and a lot of people, were kind of the not really before and afters, but like the compare and contrast between the uh, the Hubble telescope, which has always you know I think yeah. fueled a whole generation of astronomers, oh, yeah. and you know the James Webb. My God, it's like going from analog to you know 8K. It, it it's amazing. Oh, yeah. It's like going from the monochromatic tube-based computer monitors many years ago to these gorgeous flat screen, high depth things we now have, right? I mean, it's just unbelievable. And uh, hey, a little tidbit, uh, just to remember, as, as I recall right, Ben, James Webb was the first director of NASA. So this telescope was named in his honor, as I, right. I think I have that right, which yep. is great, you know, because you keep throwing out Webb, James Webb, Webb Telescope, who's a friend of mine the other day said, well, who is this Webb guy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pre pre pretty fundamental to the starting of NASA and their mission. And um, yeah, and, and I guess my little fun fact about NASA was that uh, originally NASA was the uh, National uh, Aeronautics and uh, Space uh, Agency Space yeah. um, Act, actually, not agency. That was my oh, fun act. fact. Oh, yeah, act interesting. Because it was oh. uh, passed by Congress, you know, in oh. 1958 or something like that for the Cold War. Um, oh, I so, get it. Yeah, so, wow, so it, it was first an act. Yep. So first it was an act by Congress, and then they created the organization, and then the organization became the agency, not the act. I get so. it. Wow, that's a good one. That's good. And talking about the images and data this week from the telescope, uh, again, before we went on air, you and I were chatting quickly about 
all those images are great. That's cool stuff. But what I really liked was this giant exoplanet and they analyzed the starlight filtering through its atmosphere and yeah. detected water clouds and a hazy environment and some elements that would be potential building blocks for, for life as we know it. So, I mean, that kind of stuff. And again, the other thing that uh, just flattens my nail, so to speak, mm -hmm. is to think about the fact that what we're seeing is millions to billions of years old, th this light that's finally got to us, right? Or got to the telescope. I, it just, it's just, it's, how, how do you wrap your head around that? <laughs> really mind blowing considering that some of these, uh, you know, some, some, some of the plants, and for those who watch the video portion, um, right. you know, it's kind of like a presentation and we can show all that. Oh good yeah, stuff. there you go. That's this exactly the, what I'm talking about. Yep, yeah. This is the composition of the atmosphere that you were talking about. And then of yep. course, uh, one of my favorite images was, I believe it was uh, SMACS. S M A C S O seven two three very catchy name. Uh, <laughs> this was this is the first one that they kind of uh, unveiled yeah, to the world. And Ralph, so freaky. Of, yeah, yeah it, it, you know, there's obviously a lot of uh, warping and lensing going on because it's looking right. so far back. But uh, some of these, uh, you know, way here in the distance, some of these more red shifted galaxies, uh, Ralph. Some of these are just over thirteen billion years old. They ah. they were formed a couple hundred million years after, or I'm sorry, a couple hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. We're yeah, looking yeah. way back in the past. It's so weird. It's just so weird. <laughs> it, it, it's it, it's awesome. It's amazing. And Ralph, like that's kind of the best part is that this is the gift that keeps on giving. You know, yeah. first set of images, you know, the first thing that they're doing and hey, this is going to be up there in space for the next, you know, 20, 30, 40 years yeah. doing what Hubble did the last 40 years. So amazing. Amazing. It's awesome. Well. But like I said, <laughs> we have other things to talk about as well that people yes, also really didn't already see and probably haven't seen. So, Ralph, talk about uh, what you try to do here on our segment. Sure, sure. Give you the boilerplate here. So, of course, I'm an aggregator of science and tech news features I find by monitoring a host of online news outlets. Drives my wife crazy when we're out in the <laughs> restaurant and I pull up the thing and I'm like, oh, look at that story. Anyway, um, I look for important and sometimes wild and crazy stories that don't usually and almost never seem to get uh, mainstream press attention, if that's understandable, given all the big news and it's really going on. And I'm always on the lookout for news that gives a glimpse into where we're headed in robotics, medical technology, sustainable energy technology, transportation advances, space research, physics, you name it. And what I do with each news item is present it the essential points. And I hope, I hope I do in a digestible form. So we're talking about condensation. And I stress to our audience what you stressed before, check out the show notes, because if you want to dive deeper, learn more about the science, the show notes will give you the images, the links, and those essential points we're going to share with you this morning here. Uh, but just please get those show notes. It's really good stuff. Absolutely. And with those show notes, uh, probably by the time you're hearing this, if you're listening to the podcast, they'll be up on our website and you can go ahead and follow along. But uh, story number one, Ralph, I think we just jump right into yeah. uh, you know, something I just had last night for dinner, chicken and rice, but hey, more specifically hey, hey. rice. Yeah, me too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's good so for this, this comes from TheVerge.com. Uh, headline here is genetically altered rice could help tackle climate change. And I just jumped on this right away. So here's the premise. What if you could use gene editing technology to boost the ability of rice, the world's number one crop, to fight climate change as it grows? So mm. recently, researchers at the Innovative Genomics Institute in Berkeley, California, announced their plan to genetically enhance rice to increase its ability to trap carbon dioxide. And if we stop for a second and just, just, just begin to imagine how many billions of acres of land are dedicated around the world to growing rice. And if you could boost the ability of rice to absorb carbon dioxide, how this would help in fighting the climate change, right? So th this is why I just jumped on this story. So again, little high school um, lesson here, all plants naturally take in the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide during photosynthesis. And eventually they transfer that carbon dioxide into the soil. Now, I'll be honest, I didn't know that last part. 
I knew about the, of course, I think we all know about plants pulling in carbon dioxide mm-hmm. from the air and so forth as part of photosynthesis. But I didn't realize that ultimately that carbon dioxide gets transferred into the soil. So that's interesting. And right. that'll play a role in this story too. You'll see in a moment. So using the gene editing technology called CRISPR, the Innovative Genomics Institute team plans to make precise changes to the rice plant's genetic information to supercharge its ability to absorb more carbon dioxide. And in addition, the research team will be looking to boost the capacity of the soil in a rice field to retain rather than release the greenhouse gases. And again, that soil factor was the flip of the coin that I didn't really know anything about. It just blows my mind. And then uh, maybe we'll do a little quick uh, tutorial on CRISPR sure. for folks who may not be aware of it. It's an acronym, C-R-I-S-P-R. And I've got in the show notes the source for where I got the generalized definition. So it's, this is geeky, but CRISPR stands for clustered, regularly, interspaced, short, palindromic repeats repetitive dna sequences called Easy CRISPR. To right. yeah just roll that off the tongue five <laughs> times in a row were observed in bacteria with spacer dna sequences in between the repeats that exactly match viral sequences again this is extraordinarily geeky stuff but it's it is kind of interesting the essence of crispr is simple it's a way of finding a specific bit of dna inside a cell After that, the next step in CRISPR gene editing is usually to alter that piece of DNA. However, CRISPR has also been adapted to do things, other things too, such as turning genes on or off without altering their sequence. And CRISPR is widely used for scientific research, like our story we just did. And in the not too distant future, many of the plants, and in fact, that future is coming on fast. And in the not too distant future, many of the plants and animals in our farms, gardens, or homes may be altered or may have been altered with CRISPR. That's true. And it's perfectly germane to the story we just did about altering rice. And rice is just the first crop these guys are going to be working on. Uh, They're going to go after other agricultural crops. What if you could do this with wheat? What if you could do this with uh, corn? And up here in Oregon, what if you could do it with grass seed plants? That's one of our biggest agricultural products up here in Oregon, where I live. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and and this gets into uh, a, another thing that I think a lot of people at the grocery store have probably seen, which is uh, GMO, uh, genetically mm. modified organisms. And yes, yes. You know, CRISPR would definitely fall under the category of a GMO. But uh, despite the marketing, Ralph, and I don't know how you feel about this, uh, and, and I'm sure that you know up there in the in the Northwest, they're very conscious of kind of you know their diet and you know where their produce comes from and stuff like that. Okay, yeah. uh, but you know, honestly, GMOs aren't really that bad. It, much like this, uh, you know, GMOs are used for everything for more nutrition, better you know, better, longer lasting food and produce, yeah. so it stays. Yeah. Yep. fresher longer get to people yes yes gmos are pretty cool and crispr is just continuing that in uh it sounds like a pretty innovative way to trap that carbon in the soil yeah yeah you know and as you were speaking i was thinking i wonder we've been fascinated with uh impossible burgers and some of these all, all beef or meat alternative burgers and so forth right and i wonder if uh crispr and genetic modification had something to do with making these things especially impossible burgers and i'm not paid for or a sponsor <laughs> of and anyway but uh, to, to to make them taste so remarkably similar not exactly yeah. like a beef patty i wonder if there was a role played by uh, genetic uh, editing to get that flavor going i don't know i'll have to research that now i'm interested <laughs> yeah it, 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 you know and and really all the science that we have somewhere yeah. someone ralph and you highlight this every time you come on the show they're <laughs> thinking of ways of using these processes in new innovative and hopefully helpful ways yes um, hopefully <laughs> yeah yeah in 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 so many of these uh, but i really like this one because it it's uh i, I am kind of curious though because i know that uh soil quality and that kind of thing uh is highly regulated by farmers you know just mm-hmm, to make sure their mm-hmm. crops can grow I, right. i'm wondering if carbon has any notable because i know about phosphorus and and, and all that kind of thing mm-hmm. um for uh, uh npk nitrogen phosphorus and right. whatever k was again um is you know, but what about carbon? Does carbon affect the quality of the soil? I don't know. Yeah, because that's an interesting you're trapping point. More of it. Yeah. Well, yeah, and and as you saw, the research there was to have the soil retain 
mm-hmm. the carbon dioxide as opposed to releasing it or re- reduce the re- release of it. So, you know, is that a deleterious thing for the soil or a good thing or up, down, in, or out? You've raised a good point. That'd be fun but to find out. Even better, instead, but, but Ralph, I, I guess, and I'll say this point and then we'll move on to the next story. But what I like <laughs> about this is that, you know, so many times, Ralph, like we have scrubbers, we, hate, we hear people talking about ways to, you know, physically build something and then get the carbon out of the air. And this is this is perfect because we don't have to build rice. We plant rice. The rice builds itself and it sucks the carbon out of the air. It, it's such a yeah. it's such a non uh, interventionist, I guess, kind of way for us. The rice just does it and we just have to plant it. And yeah, that's exactly perfect. And of course, the byproduct, we get to feed people. It's uh, it's yeah. almost like a win win. I, I, I love story number one. Well, yeah, it's a clear win-win if you could double or triple the capacity to absorb carbon dioxide in plants of all kinds, uh, agricultural plants. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> d- definitely. And, that, and that's just, uh, and of course, that's huge for so many people. Story number one, story number two, uh, yeah. and really everyone, uh, just so you know, story number two, three, and four were all heading into space, but that's perfectly fine because, you know, there's problems up there too. There's problems on Earth and there's problems in space that affect us just as much. <laughs> and, um, you know, we opened the show with a little segment about James Webb and the telescope. Story number two is uh, vitally important because the more we want to send stuff up there, the more we kind of have to keep track of. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of trash up there. And story yeah, number two amen. could be just the answer. Yes, that's right. Headline here is China recently used a huge drag sale to clear up space junk. And I got this from interestingengineering.com, which is really a very fun outlet. Check it out. It's a lot of fun. So, of course, Ben, we've all heard about space junk orbiting our planet. Uh, Our Department of Defense estimates there's about 30,000 pieces of orbital debris that includes about 5,000 dead satellites. Satellites that are just, you know, they've done their job, they conked out, and they're just up there swirling (laughs) around. So, recently... Chinese scientists at the Shanghai Academy of Spaceflight Technology demonstrated a remarkable way to clean up space trash using a huge sail. Wow, the proof of concept demonstration used an approximately 270 square foot sail made from an incredibly thin membrane, only one tenth the thickness of a human hair to trap and then remove the final stage component of one of their long March 2 rockets from Mm. Earth's orbit. So here's how it worked. Once the module launched into orbit, of course, a module carrying the giant sail came close to the rocket debris, the sail automatically unfolded or deployed and snagged it. And you think, oh, okay, that's nice. But the giant sail then caused this this bulk or this mass of the um, sail wrapping around the debris, caused the rocket's orbit, the debris, to rapidly decay or, you know, lower, drawing it back into the atmosphere where it and the sail disintegrated. So this is a very targeted, very focused. They were able to deploy this thing, get it right up to the target they wanted, deploy the sail, grab it force it to decay its orbit, boom, and it's gone. So, of course, we're bound to see this more in the future, as the article talks about, as drag sales offer a relatively low-cost solution. And here's my take. This is a key step forward, but not the only idea active today to address the problem. So, I wanted to make sure people understand that this is one of many ideas people are looking at around the world for this problem. For example, there's the United Kingdom's Harpoon Hunter, Weighing in at about 220 pounds, this target-savvy satellite combines a harpoon that shoots out at 65 feet per second with a net that's 16 feet wide to trap space junk and pull it back to Earth's atmosphere. So a very similar kind of concept, right? And you can I've got the link in the show notes there. You can check it out on Popular Science. Really fun uh, uh, article. And the article outlines multiple solutions. It's just one of, I think, six solutions they look at in the article uh, that are all in the works or in progress and so forth for dealing with space trash. And here's one thing that, that we try to be upbeat whenever we can. But I do have to give a Debbie Downer nugget to this. Oh, yeah? It's one thing to say, okay, I'm going to deploy my sail, drag sail thing to get one of my pieces of debris. But mm-hmm. it also, sad to say, could be used in a hostile way to go after 
enemy satellites or you know you're you don't like this satellite you send one of the things up drag sail it down to the atmosphere burn it up but it's gone so that that's i hesitated i thought should i bring up this negative thing i think i'd be remiss yeah. not to because it could be used for bad purposes so leave yeah. it at that <laughs> of course clearing out space debris is um you know very very important but of course like you said uh, eventually someone's going to take down a satellite that they don't like not that they don't need yeah. it anymore but that they don't yeah. like um, yeah. and, and, and that gets into a whole thing of, you know, space and the supposed neutrality of space, all that kind of thing. But I did want to kind of say that, you know, uh, image renditions oh, uh, yeah. like this kind of give people the idea that, you know, this is what space looks like. It's just a big layer <laughs> of just mess. trash right above, you know, it's just a big mess. It's like someone didn't pick up their room and it's full of that. <laughs> um, Ralph, I, and, and I'm not saying that like, it's not that big of a problem. It's a huge problem, but 30,000 pieces spread out over you know an, a surface area larger than the earth because it's obviously the atmosphere around right. the earth um, right they're pretty few and far between but yeah. it's annoying yeah. to have to track thirty thousand pieces so to take them down is important <laughs> uh, my last point that i want to say is this is a cool idea um definitely great on china for cleaning up its mess because you know if it sends it up there if it doesn't need any more Take care of it, you know, take it down. But I guess the bigger solution and one that I think we've talked about on the show before is the idea of actually capturing these satellites and repurposing them be, or, mm-hmm. or, or at least recycling them. Because, Ralph, you know, we did pay and by we, I mean, whoever sent these things up there, they paid a lot of money, you know, a lot of rocket fuel, a lot of cost. It cost millions of dollars, uh, you know, per pound to get something up into space. Yeah. And it, wouldn't it be nicer to capture it and recycle it without having to bring it back down to the earth and, you know, just yeah. inc- and, and incinerate it? That I think yeah. would be the ultimate, you know, answer yeah. is to capture and recycle. But you know what? Picking up on your idea, which is intriguing. So, what if you had a, um, a, a module that you could launch mm-hmm. and it has like a giant, you know, trap door or something and it grabs the satellite and then comes back you know it's not designed to disintegrate in the uh, atmosphere but like a, a capsule carrying astronauts would come back in and come back to earth and then you could salvage the uh, components and so forth maybe who knows yeah, uh, well well the components are one thing but to keep it in space because let's face it metal is kind of hard to you know process metal is kind of hard to come by in our uh, <laughs> you know in our immediate orbit uh to, to actually capture it and melt it down and then maybe use it for something else uh would be ideal and honestly yeah you know that sounds far-fetched and you would need a lot of energy to melt something down but that's my best segue into story number three, because, hey, <laughs> this might be a way to get that energy into space. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, they're using a little bit of a different way, but I like story number three. Yeah, I got this from uh, two sources, and there were many other articles about this, too, but primarily got it from Newsweek and then Axios. Headline here is U.S. military wants to send a fusion reactor powered test craft into space. And as I recall, right, they have a target date of doing this in about five years. So the U.S. military's Defense Innovation Unit, that must be an interesting place to work, wants to send an experimental craft into space powered by a tiny nuclear fusion reactor. And tiny and nuclear fusion reactor seem oxymoronic, but it's fascinating. And it has partnered with a private company called Avalanche Energy, to get a prototype power system operational by 2027. And Avalanche Energy's breakthrough solution is a small reactor that uses the same nuclear fusion process that powers the sun. Quick sidebar here on uh, nuclear fusion. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nuclear fusion is a reaction in which two or more atomic nuclei are combined to form one or more different atomic nuclei and subatomic particles. The difference in mass between the reactants and products is manifested as either the release or absorption of energy. Well, the release of energy is the goal here, and it's, it's profound in terms of the amount of energy it releases. Uh, But back to the story here, called the Orbitron, that's the name for the little mini nuclear fission fusion, right. pardon me, reactor. It's about the size of a lunchbox, which the company Avalanche Energy says you can hold in one hand. What? What? Wow. And here's a really cool feature, in my opinion, of the company's approach to powering a spacecraft. The tiny modular Orbitron nuclear fusion reactors can be strung together like battery cells to make it possible to scale up 
a spacecraft's power system as needed. So maybe one spacecraft only needs one of these little lunchbox reactors. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe another one, you need three of them, four of them, whatever. So the fact that you can um, tag team or, or, or daisy chain uh, these yeah. guys together, yeah. I think is just, uh, the story is fascinating to me all the way around, not least of which having a lunchbox size nuclear fusion reactor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You, you could even take a few into space as backups. Yeah. Sure. Ve sure. Very, very, very cool. And of, of course, uh, like I was saying, to be able to use it not just as uh, you know, not yeah. just as a fuel source, but as a power source for anything that you may be doing up there. Uh, Ralph, a, a, and you know, just going from Earth to Mars and Mars and back. Uh, yeah. You know, there's very, very few Shell gas stations uh, between here and there. <laughs> it's, uh, you're you're going to need something like this if we're ever going to, you know, kind of do anything serious outside of Earth and, you know, yeah. and the moon. So, this is very cool. Nice concept. And the artwork is, uh, let's face it, straight out, straight out of science fiction because the yeah, concept cool. is straight out of science fiction. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But they're actually working on it. So, very, very cool. Uh, story and 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 by the way, ladies and gentlemen, if you want uh, some uplifting news, uh, always follow nuclear uh, fission reactors. I, I believe it's uh, no fusion. I'm sorry, F fission is, is what traditionally what uh, right. nuclear reactors are. Fusion. Check out nuclear fusion because uh, Ralph. I don't know if you've been kind of keeping up with that as well, but. Uh, you know, everyone from China to uh, the the people over in Europe and the big consortium over there, uh, fusion has actually come a long way. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that it's here yet, but mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. on Earth, it has the mm -hmm. it has the potential for limitless energy on Earth with no yep. you know fossil fuels or anything like that, no, yeah. no emissions. It's yep. uh, it's pretty cool. So definitely yeah. keep an eye on that. Story number yeah. four, though, uh, Ralph. Check this out. This is uh, speaking of going to Mars. Um, I, I, I guess I forgot that's what the next story was. Uh, getting to Mars, pretty difficult. But hey, maybe if we just sailed away. <laughs> sort of, kind of. <laughs> so this one comes from Popular Science. A uh, headline here is New Sailplane Could Cruise Mars for Months Using Only the Wind to Fly. First of all, uh, I didn't yeah. even know there was wind on Mars, so this is cool. Well, there, the, yeah, there, there is there's enough here for these guys to think they can pull this off, and I'm mm -hmm. sure they've done their research. <laughs> yeah. So here we go. A team of aerospace engineers from the University of Arizona and NASA Ames Research Center recently disclosed their prototype for a Mars sailplane that would only need the power of the wind to fly in the Martian atmosphere. Now, the experimental craft to me, and you can, you're showing the photo right now, looks like a big model airplane with a wingspan, I guess, around 10 feet. I never found exact uh, specs on the size of the wingspan, so I had to guess based on the assumption that the yeah, fellow they're holding feet. it is maybe yeah. six foot tall guy and so forth. Anyway, so creating a vehicle that can fly on Mars presents big challenges, and they include vast potential dust storms, uh, of course, less surface gravity, and an atmosphere there is an atmosphere 100 times thinner than ours here on Earth. Wow. Imagine trying to fly in that, right? So yeah. last year, NASA's Ingenuity Mars helicopter, as we all know, successfully flew on Mars. I think it got about 10 feet up off the surface. But it needs constant solar power to operate. So here was the idea to create a non powered solution, the design team took advantage of the dynamic soaring technique albatross birds use <laughs> to ride air currents for thousands of miles above the ocean without needing to land or rest. And I think most of us can picture in our mind a, an image of an albatross bird and the big wings, wingspan and how they just kind of yeah. gracefully glide and they, they turn and they take advantage of the shifting in the wind currents and all this groovy yeah, stuff to go up ever. and down. Yeah, but they yeah. hardly ever flap their wings. They're amazing. Exactly. Exactly right. So these guys said, hey, they've got something going on here with this dynamic soaring technique. How could we apply it to a vehicle that could fly on Mars with no need for uh, solar power or energy or fuel or anything, right? So mm -hmm. the Mars sales, sailplane team also plans to engineer the craft to be completely autonomous with an onboard computer that will constantly monitor wind conditions in the Martian atmosphere to find the optimal trajectory to maintain flight, just like an albatross bird does. It's just instinctually 
compensates to keep going. Right. And here's what makes the lightweight and inexpensive sailplanes design really clever in my view. It's an inflatable craft. Let that sink in. It's an inflatable craft that can fit into a shoebox size carrier and then be inflated when it's delivered to Mars. What? And yeah. as I recall, right, I think I saw in some of the articles, uh, in fact, you're showing the picture there with the balloon. The mm -hmm. idea is you would, you would um, deploy this thing in orbit over Mars. It would float down. And then once it's able to deal with the Martian atmosphere, be released and it can start flying like an albatross bird. Right. And then with the ability to fly for days or even months, Without fuel or an engine, NASA says we'll be able to explore areas of Mars we've never been able to reach to date. So what a clever idea, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and really it's the difference between dri driving your car and taking a plane. You don't have to deal with terrain. <laughs> yeah. And let's face yeah. it, uh, g getting around on Mars is pretty hostile. Not, not a lot of roads. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is amazing. And the fact that, it, you know, a shoebox size carrier and then it just yeah. kind of pops out and, you know, just does one of those things. It's uh, and, and, you know, the fact that NASA is already in on this, you know, saying that this is their prototype. They work with the university uh, to do this. Uh, yes. the University of Arizona and NASA. Yeah. Um, very, very promising. Love yeah. Love everything so cool. about it. Definitely. Super so, clever. Uh, yeah, they're they have some smart. Uh, this may be redundant. They have some smart people over at NASA. It's uh, very very <laughs> yes. cool. So, Ralph, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show every week and talking to us about the stories that you find. They're always fun, always uplifting, and uh, even sometimes so uplifting they could be called inflatable. Get it? Last story? <laughs> Good enough. Okay, everyone. So there you go. More Ralph Bond over at ComputerAmerica.com. Also on YouTube, we have a whole playlist just of Ralph. And be sure to check out his site as well. Ralph, I hope you have a great weekend. Everyone out there, I hope you have a great weekend as well. And catch us here next week, same time, Computer America. Everyone, bye-bye. <laughs>